welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have Alam Waijia here today to talk a little bit more about her journey in public health. Uh, we will have a Q&A portion at the end, but for now we'll keep everyone on mute and uh, let you know when it's time to kind of chime in and, and ask some questions. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you so much, Caroline. I'm so excited to be here. Hi, everyone. I wish I was um, back at the Bloomberg campus with all of you. <laughs> it just seems like yesterday that uh, I was there. Um, but uh, just to uh, share with everybody, um, I'm, my, my name is YJ and I'm from Singapore. So that's 12 hours um, uh, uh, ahead of all of you. Um, and the title of my, my talk today is called The Public Health Journey, Never a Straight Line. And I'm sure many of you who have just you know entered Johns Hopkins or just start at your school or just maybe at the uh, either at the beginning or in the middle of your career, you might have questions about, you know, where am I and where do I stand? And I just hope that today's talk will inspire and encourage you um, wherever you are uh, in your journey. So let's begin. Um, some of you might be wondering, who am I? Uh, who am I as in like, what is my background is YGA, yeah. but some of you might be wondering the same question about yourselves, like who am I and what is my place in public health? I remember when we first started out our public health journey at Johns Hopkins, you know, everybody was like bristling with brilliance and eagerly anticipating like a new year, a fresh start. But you know, back at the, uh, behind everybody's head was the question like who am I and what is my place ultimately in this big landscape of public health so just to give you a little uh, starter about who I am uh, I came from the alumni class of uh, 2018 uh, right now I'm a humanitarian doctor in risk communication and community engagement some of you might be wondering what is that I'll get to that in a little while uh, I'm also the founder of Kites on Global and a project lead of um, a networking platform for to help migrant workers. Now, all that you see on screen right now that I'm sharing, I was not in 2018 when I graduated from Johns Hopkins. So you can see how much has happened. But when I was at Johns Hopkins doing my Master's of Public Health, really, the main question that I asked myself was, what am I doing here? And some of you might be wondering the same thing. Uh, I'd like to begin my talks with showing a picture of my family because I really think all of us are real human beings. You know, sometimes we, we come to school thinking, I got to put my best foot forward. And and you know what? At the end of the day, we're all just real people. We are real people living real lives. Um, back then when I was at Hopkins, I only had a little baby and now I have two uh, grown girls <laughs> who sometimes remind me of teenagers. So time really flies. And that's Cliff, my husband, who was with me in Baltimore. Now this is proof that I was actually at Johns Hopkins. <laughs> so that's Sarah Faith. Um, she was five months old when I first started my program and she was wearing um, my little Johns Hopkins orientation tag over there. Um, oh, this is proof that I, I went to school with a baby and I thought it was such a bad idea because, um, you know, my, majority of my classmates were not moms. Majority of my classmates were really bright students. They were all, you know, at the cusp of, you know, going into something really great and terrific. And there I was starting school uh, as a new mom and thinking to myself, oh my, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. It's it's like a two-year program compressed in 10 months and I have this whole new mothering thing to do. Like, what do I do? And I know many of you are in, you might be in different life stages, but maybe you have your own struggles, your own challenges to deal with. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's um, getting to a relationship. Maybe it's coming out of a relationship. I just know that in our class, so many of us had different trials and challenges to go through. And I just want to start off by saying that you are not a alone. Like this is all part and parcel of doing a master's in that we're all in different phases of life. And if you are struggling with something, one thing or another, please know that it is normal and it is okay. So this is proof that I started off with a five-month-old baby. And I remember um, when just before I came to Johns Hopkins, I had over $100,000 to raise for my tuition. And I'm like, where is that money going to come from? And I went for scholarship interviews. Every time I said that, you know, I was pregnant or I had just delivered a baby, I just thought to myself, you know, maybe they're going to mark me down. I don't know. But the truth is this, if you don't give yourself a chance, no one will. So I just want to encourage you to give yourself that chance to start with. The big question all of us ask ourselves is, what am I doing here right? at Johns Hopkins? I mean, you finally got in after, um, you know, all the applications and everything. Maybe some of you knew that you would breeze right in. But for me, um, I actually 
um, applied a number of times. And it was not because I was rejected, but really the first time when I applied, my husband proposed. And so I had to put it on hold. And the second time, we were given an opportunity to serve in Uganda. And only the third time um, when I applied, I actually pushed through the applications. And when I finally got to Johns Hopkins, I just felt, you know, so much is weighing on me. I've got all these scholarships behind my back. You know, I, I got to make a difference. And I'm sure many of you are in the same place. You've, you've made sacrifices to be here. And I just want to share these three, three things with you. If there is nothing else you get out of this talk, I hope and pray that you would take away these three main points, which is embrace who you are, embrace your season, and embrace your limitations. And I hope that this will bring you through, not just through your master's program, but through life, wherever you are. I want to first begin with a personal story. This started when I was 17 years old and I decided to go to Nepal on a short six-week trip to live with some children in a children's home and these have these girls have become my friends. Um, they were abandoned at one point and abused. But uh, over the years, as I continued to, you know, watch them grow up, I remember the first time when I was at the home, what struck me was just, you know, their joy and the, the love on their faces when um, I got to know them and their, their house parents and their upbringing. But something tragic happened in the middle of my stay and we were all evicted at short notice. And when that happened, something that really triggered got something deep inside of me was what can I do and how can I help and I'm sure each and every one of you you have that stirring in your heart to make a difference to our world and that's why you're at Johns Hopkins the world's best but while that happened as a 17 year old when I had no skills no qualifications no certifications nobody to believe in me and say you can change the world I thought to myself what these girls really need is a permanent home because year after year they were getting evicted and that was painful not only for me as an outsider to watch but for them to experience year after year and so um, this idea came to my mind that maybe if I just painted a picture book to raise funds for them um, maybe we could raise funds to build a permanent home for them and I know to some of you it sounds like you know it sounds like it's possible but back then when I was 17 nobody believed in it everybody said that Everybody I spoke to, they all said, you know, when you're somebody, then you can do something. But right now you're just too small and nobody's going to buy that book. <laughs> you can't even paint. Well, I didn't. But the amazing thing was one person believed in me and that was all it took. In the next three months, uh, Kite Song, the book was published. I taught myself how to paint. I, I couldn't do anything good, uh, paint anything well at the time. The first time my publisher saw my paintings, he said, these are so bad. <laughs> Um, but in the in the following three months, over a hundred thousand dollars was raised, and in the next year, this home was purchased for the girls. And so, in the picture, you can see a uh, really small my husband and myself, um, together with the girls at the home. And the girls that you saw in the first picture, right now they've grown up. They are totally different. They are they are young women now. Um, two of them have little girls the same age as mine. Many of them are teachers. One of them is a nurse. And over here, you see. Um, um, two pictures that I put up in my living room no matter where in the world I am and it's nearly the same girls seated in almost the same positions but 10 years apart and I share this with you I share this with you because many of us have little dreams that are in our hearts and we just think to ourselves you know I don't know where it's going to go but I want to share this with you that as long as you believe in it there is uh, the power of small dreams to birth something greater than we dare imagine and so what matters the most is that you believe in your dreams. So as you start your year at Hopkins, my hope is that you would believe in the little dreams that you have. And maybe some of you think, oh, but I have really big dreams. <laughs> That's also a good place to start. But, you know, it, our big dreams all start with little dreams. Um, I want to go into this, um, this, this drawing because this is an illustration of my second book. And it says, it feels like the storm will never end. And um, this was actually... Um, painted during my recovery from anorexia and depression while I was in medical school and some of you go through you know different kinds of mental health challenges and I just want to reach out and say that you know it's it's part and parcel of life it really is and when you're in a master's program when it's so stressful you might think to yourself I don't know if I can cope I don't know if I can push through but the truth is that 
with community, with friends, with faith, you can actually do this. I remember um, just before I went to Hopkins, I spent a year in Uganda. And when I came back, um, I really consolidated all the picture books that I'd done to raise funds for various kinds of causes, etc. And the funny thing was, in spite of all the funds and money that I'd raised for various philanthropic causes, the first thing I thought of when I came to Hopkins was, they must not know. Yeah, they must not know. I remember coming to school thinking to myself, I'm here to prove myself. I, I better make sure that nobody knows that I'm like, a, I don't want them to think of me as a fluffy picture book illustrator. I got to put my best foot forward. And even before I came to Hopkins, you know, with all the scholarships that I had on my back, I thought to myself, I have to have a project with the UN or with the WHO, at least, you know, I've got to have something to show for. And so nobody must know that I am a children's a picture book illustrator. Nobody must know that that, um, you know, there's this side of me. I wanted to hide it. But what I really learned through the year is this. Embrace who you really are because that is the first step that you can really take to be an authentic public health leader. Like nobody wants to think of yourself in a certain way. We all want to be the public health leader that we admire. But it took me an entire year in Johns Hopkins to realize that we all come in different shapes and sizes and to embrace who you really are takes courage, it takes candor, but most of all, it's the only way forward. I want to share this picture with you. It's, it's, it's a picture of the amazing women all around the world, the friends that I had made. And I want to encourage you not to just dig into your books at Johns Hopkins because your friends, your colleagues, they are your greatest cheerleading team. You know, in this picture alone, I have friends from Iran, from Syria, from, from Ecuador, from America, from Cameroon, it's, and from China. It's, it's amazing. And there you see uh, my little baby. And these um, these women were really my cheerleading squad to get through the school year. And likewise, I believe that each and every one of you need to have your own um, squad, you know, to cheer you on and likewise for you to sow into their lives too. Um, I share this picture because you know what? When I first came to Johns Hopkins, I actually met a professor and she said this to me. It was so bizarre. She hardly knew me. I wasn't even sure if she was going to teach me. And the first time she met me and Sarah Faith, I know some of you are going like, ah, oh, no. <laughs> if we, when I give this talk in an auditorium, the, the oohs and ahs are very <laughs> audible. <laughs> but yes, this was Sarah Faith in the nursing room down in the basement at, at, at Johns Hopkins. But um, when, when my professor first met her, she actually said this, she said that you think, and she just said this right to my face. I was so shocked. I mean, I was like a stranger to her. She said, you think um, your baby is going to be a burden to you, but you have no idea the blessing that she's going to be to you and to the school. And when she said that, I just got a little taken aback. I'm like, is this like a Hopkins thing? I don't know, like professors telling students strange things along the corridors, you know? But this professor actually said that to me. And the amazing thing was this, was that truly Sarah Faith, my, my firstborn, she became an icon at Johns Hopkins. And the moment I started embracing who I really was and embracing the season of life that I was in, I realized that I could finally be who I was and be comfortable in, in my skin. And this picture that you see here really is a culmination of that because what had happened was that throughout the entire year, I spent 10 months of the 11th month program, or maybe nine months of the 11th month program trying to be someone I wasn't. I was trying to get a UN project, a WHO project. And one day in desperation, across the road, there was the Johns Hopkins Hospital. I, I wasn't graduating with a no project, right? But my, my supervisor said, look, YJ, like, you're like the last one. Like, you still haven't gotten a capstone. And I said, I know, but I haven't gotten a project that I really want. So I went over to Johns Hopkins Hospital. I found this professor and I thought to myself, he's like my last effort. Like, I have gone to so many professors and I'm just going to beg him for a project. Like, any project, just give it to me. I need to graduate, okay? And I remember him looking at my resume and he said, I want to see your books. And I brought up my books to show him and he just looked at me and he said what you want I cannot give you and he said what you really want is written all over your resume tell me what it really is and for the first time in my life and for the first time in Johns Hopkins I actually told someone another complete stranger <laughs> I said I really just want to start 
a nonprofit. I don't know what it's supposed to do, but it's going to be named after my first book, Kites on Global. And I just want it to help people through public health. And he said, that's your capstone project. And I remember running back all the way back to, um, you know, campus, running to my supervisor's office, um, Dr. Andrea Ruff. And I just knocked on her door. I'm like, Dr. Andy, I know what I'm supposed to do. And I remember her breaking out into this benevolent smile. And she said, I knew you would come to your senses. I knew you would arrive, she said. <laughs> and when I told her, she just said, you know, this just feels so right. And I remember um, when it was Sarah Faith's birthday, my firstborn's first birthday, you know, she had become such an icon in school because I would bring her for lunch hour every day in school. And so many people would just tell me how she lit up the, the, the atmosphere. She became such an icon that when I celebrated her birthday, I actually requested for a little classroom to just celebrate it with a few classmates and maybe launch Kite Song Global. And unexpectedly, it turned into this huge school event. Like, it was just out of my control. I didn't book the place. I didn't book the food. It just all happened through the culmination of friends and people and professors who really sold into this. And so what you see here is Feinstone Hall. Um, welcome to Kites on Global's launch and Seraphate's first birthday. And it's unbelievable because here you see hundreds of people, people that I've never even met or don't even know. And they say, I, we know your daughter, so we can just show up. <laughs> and I remember the security guards were, um, actually, they had to come up because there were too many people in the room, so they had to limit. But here you really see um, the culmination of lives coming together. And I share this because this would not have been possible had I not embraced my season. And so the first thing I said was, embrace who you really are. Don't try to hide it. And the second thing is embrace your season. I always thought that because of who I am, you know, the accent that I speak, the place that I come from, the color of my skin or um, the life stage that I'm at, that I was such a, at such a disadvantage. You know, I came to school thinking all that. And the amazing thing about the Hopkins environment is that it's just this amazing microcosm, right, of social justice and support and um, good cheer, that you can't help but just flourish in that place. And those of you who might be struggling, I just want to encourage you that if you are truly struggling to just take a step out of your, your pressure bubble and take a look at the people, the amazing people and stories around you and ask yourself, who am I really? What have I brought to Hopkins? And what do I really want out of this? Because I realized then at this moment when this happened that I don't want a thesis to bring home that has nothing to do with my passions or interests. I don't want to have a professor or uh, to beg for a project that has nothing to do with my interests or my life stage. I want something that's really who I am. And I think that's what makes the Hopkins experience so unique. It's that each of you are bringing your full selves to the table. And that is the only way you can get 100% out of it. Not just the Hopkins program, but in life. If you bring your whole unfragmented self to school, to work, 100% is what you're going to get out of it. And that is integrity. Integrity really is being whole and undivided. So I want to encourage you, embrace your season wherever you're at, whether you're in a breakup, whether you've um, you know, just had a baby, I don't know, maybe you're, you're looking for a relationship, whatever season you're in, that can be special and unique to your Hopkins experience. Instead of a drag, it could be the very thing you need to propel you to your next stage forward if you embrace it. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting to the second half of my presentation. Now here you see me, uh, I'm giving a talk. And it's, it was very bizarre because in the first few slides, you, you remember I shared that I had, had anorexia and depression before in medical school. And really, I had scraped through medical schools with Bs and Cs. And I thought to myself, it is impossible. It will be impossible for me to get a scholarship of any kind. And somebody spoke over my life and said that, you know, one day you will be speaking in the States and you will be sharing your experience to set the lives of people free. And when that um, that was spoken over my life, I thought to myself, That's, that sounds really like it's a feel-good message, but I kind of not believe it, <laughs> right? But your pain has a purpose. And whatever that you've walked through, you've been through in life, 
as you bring that through Hopkins or whatever journey that you're journeying through right now, I believe that it has a purpose and your circumstances are actually central to where you're going to go. So here you see me in Nashville, actually, because one day while I was preparing for the Kite Song Global launch at Johns Hopkins, I still remember where I was was sitting. It was like outside the Summers Hall. I was outside the bathroom and I had this phone call and I like never pick up my phone, you know, in school. But that day I chose to pick it up. Thank God. <laughs> and there's this woman on Nashville on the phone and I'm like, why are you calling me? And she's like, I picked up one of your picture books and it was given to me by my friend who is the sister-in-law of a psychiatrist who is like the friend of a professor and that professor is your professor and she said she found that book on her table and I'm like whoa this is like four degrees of separation right there and she's like you you're not even in the same state like what's going on and she's like when I read your story I knew that I wanted to invite you as the keynote speaker to our conference and I said and the first thing that I thought in my head was whoa you don't even know me and besides your conference is probably going to be during the school term I probably can't make it and you know um I, I don't speak with an American accent so I don't really know if you want me as a keynote you know and then she she just looked at me and she I mean she 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 said over the phone she said no it's you and she said what 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 is your keynote what do you speak about and I said my, my keynote signature talk is on pursuing dreams and she just went ballistic she's like that has been the theme of our conference since January now it's June we're still looking you are the person and that's how I showed up and I share this story because some of you might think that the experiences that you carry like the pain or the baggage that you have is detrimental to your moving forward through your master's program through Hopkins through your next career stage and I just want to share that that could be the very thing that you need to kind of solidify all that you have gone through and sew it back into someone else's lives. And so I hope that that encourages you that wherever that you're at right now, that you can make a difference. So after all this had happened, <laughs> it was quite a lot, but um, Kaizong Global was set up. You know, I, I, I left the States, you know, I graduated, went back to, to, to Canada. I delivered my second baby. Lots happened. I went back to Singapore. And guess what? COVID-19 broke out. Um, some of you know this, um, that uh, in Singapore, there was a huge migrant worker outbreak. So tens of thousands of low-wage migrant workers living in high-density accommodation had COVID-19. And I remember going back to Singapore thinking to myself, you know what? I am now graduated from, from Johns Hopkins. Surely I can make a difference. But guess what? I felt like I couldn't. I was still nursing and breastfeeding my, my second child. I was out of the, the, the health system for three years. I hadn't seen patients like on a like a clinical basis one-on-one -on -one, for seven years and I thought to myself I'm not relevant anymore in the outbreak and I just went into it with such low self-esteem such difficulty to reconciling like how could I have done all that at Johns Hopkins started Kites on Global don't even know what it is and now I'm faced with the outbreak and I don't know what to do but the amazing thing was this when I knew that I had so little to offer all my supervisor asked me was, why do you want to help? And I said, yes. So there you see from um, the third, from the right, that's me. Um, that's me, like first time in PPE, like ever, like I can remember since medical school. And I remember that one day there was a turning point and that was while I was in the front line swabbing patients and migrant workers, I saw this huge communication gap that no one was actually explaining what was happening to these migrant workers who weren't speaking English. And one day my supervisor called me and he said, Waijia, I need you to help us to illustrate a health booklet. And whoa, I just got so mad. I, you, you would have thought I would have said, oh yeah, sure, finally I can help. But no, I'm sorry to say there was a rising indignation in me. I thought to myself, you know what? I came from Hopkins. I graduated with, you know, like top 10% of my class. And now you're just asking me to do a help. What, what do you think I am? Like a cartoonist or what, you know? And I was offended. But I remember, I think, I, I'm so thankful that my husband, who is my better half all the time, said to me, YJ, you just got to put your hand to the plow and whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Because this is the one thing that you've been tasked with in the outbreak. And so I started to draw these um 
cartoons for health booklets. And before I knew it, one day I had a phone call uh, or an email rather from the chairperson of the World Health Organization steering committee in Singapore. And he said, I need to talk to you. So I was like, me? Are you sure? Like, what do you want? And he showed me this web diagram, um, Professor Dale Fisher. And he said, you know what? Are you a cartoonist? Because we need you. And I looked at him and I was like, what? You can call me a thousand other things, but I'm not a cartoonist. No offense to cartoonists who are full-time, okay? But, but you know where I'm coming from. I had so much pride. I didn't want to be labeled as a cartoonist. And he said, you have plucked the gap in risk communications and community engagement. And he's like, you are doing this thing without even knowing it. And, and when I told him that I, I, I had I had an MPH and you know I, that I was really a doctor and all that, he said, okay, it all makes sense now you are doing RCCE without knowing it. And so this entire um, little health booklet thing, it snowballed into this um, movement. It really became this huge movement where it consolidated all the different health uh, clusters in Singapore and it became something larger than I ex expected. And because of that, um, I ended up being deployed with the United Nations uh, at a later time um, together with World Health Organization and the Global Outbreak Alert Response Network as an RCCE consultant in Eswatini. So that's me in Africa. Earlier this year, I was there for almost two months. And at that moment, when I wore the UNICEF vest, this picture, it's very significant to me because I was on the cusp of turning a year old. I spent my birthday there. And I suddenly had a revelation because all my life, through medical school, through my master's, work, I always had this thought that I'm not good enough that there's somebody else who can do this better, that maybe it was a mistake, the people who gave me this opportunity, the scholarships, the, 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 maybe it was all one big mistake. But as I was wearing that UNICEF vest standing there, for the first time, I realized that all the mistakes that I had thought I had made, all the inadequacies, the insufficiencies that I thought I, I was as a medical student, as a junior doctor, as a mid-level medical officer, that all those things weren't mistakes. What they really were, were indicators and signposts of what I was really meant to do. And so one of the things I want to encourage you to see is that failure is not a, a setback. Rather, failure is an opportunity to see what you're good and what you're not good at. It's an opportunity to see and to discover who you really are. And I realized that the reason why things weren't working out in the surgical specialties that I really wanted to pursue was really because I was made for something different. And when I embraced who I really was, when I embraced my season, I realized that at the same time, the greatest lesson I learned was to embrace my limitations. So this is me in Africa doing my thing. I'm totally in my element, in, in the zone. And what I realized was this that when I could embrace my limitations, it was incredibly freeing. When I was in the outbreak, I was most limited. I was working part-time. I was breastfeeding. I, was, I felt tied down. Do you understand? Like, like, like my hands are tied. I want to do more, but I can't. And some of you might be in those seasons. Maybe there's a family crisis. I remember when I went through my master's program, so many of my classmates, you know, the parents fell ill or they had to attend a funeral, they had to fly back, this and that. So many different things. Or you've got to get married, whatever. And you might feel like those are limitations to you moving forward on the career ladder. But guess what? When you embrace your limitations, we realize that, you know what? These are part and parcel of the journey, the meandering journey of weaving you into the public health professional that you were really meant to be, whether it's someone of compassion, of leadership, of, of authenticity. Because when you're deployed somewhere or when you're asked to work in an outbreak or when you're asked to serve in a crisis, what do you really have other than your true self? There is nobody else that you can try to be. <laughs> there, is like, there is like no imposter syndrome that you can, you can try to brace or put up anymore. You are just who you are. And the sooner we learn to embrace ourselves and our seasons and our limitations, the better it will be for us. And so I come to this landing point at the end of my talk you know, really wanting to encourage each and every one of you that if you're listening in, it is not a mistake that you are here. I'm so glad 
that you got to hear this message. But most of all, my hope is that you will take away this message that you are unique. And what you bring to the table in public health is incredibly unique. You, you just, just think of me. Some, of, some people have asked me this question, like, you are a little, you're a little Asian Singaporean woman, you know, even when you go outside, I mean, there's, there's like hierarchies and, and unseen, you know, barriers that people don't talk about. And how do you, how do you overcome them, you know, when you're supposed to be a specialist? And I just tell myself, you know what, I embrace my limitations and I use them to my strengths. Because who would have known that all that I had been through, whether it was depression, whether it was being a mom, whether it was carrying a baby to school, who would have known that all those different things would be a blessing in disguise? And I really think the only difference was a matter of perspective. So I'll end off with this. If you stay true to who you really are, your public health calling will find you. Some of you think, wow, this girl just landed a UNWHO job right in her lap just for drawing cartoons. Well, can I tell you something? The first time I dreamt of working with the UN or WHO was when I was 17 years old when I was writing in my medical school applications. I hope I will do something remotely meaningful. Okay, maybe I didn't use the word remotely, but is it something meaningful with the World Health Organization on the UN? I had no idea how it's going to happen. And I came to Hopkins, I was knocking on every door of like professors who had some connection with it and it didn't work out. And how I came back to working with them was really through discovering my true joy which was starting Kite Song Global as a non-profit, even though I had no idea what it was meant to do at that time. And the reason why it took off was because during the pandemic, when they needed me to do the health booklets and to step in with RCCE, Kite Song Global had the infrastructure to do all of that. We were printing tens of thousands of health booklets because we had translators, volunteers, graphic designers, all that. We had the infrastructure set in place for what I did not know would be required of in a pandemic. And so truly, if you stay true to who you are, I believe that you, no, it's not that, you, it's not that you will find your public health calling, but I believe that if you stay true to who you are, your public health calling will find you. That is the difference. It will seek you out because you are, when you're authentic, your calling has no choice but to hone in on what you have to offer to the world because the world needs it from you. And so to those of you who are starting the school year or maybe you're in the middle of some crisis or a career trajectory, I just want you to leave with this. And that is, if you stay true to who you are, you can't go wrong. Be authentic. Be the person that you were made to be and bring that to the table because that's what the world needs. Okay, I wish we were there in person because if we were, I would have loved to have lunch with you upstairs. I remember the cafeteria. That sounds a really nice salad. I hope it's still there. <laughs> but if not, you are welcome to follow me on Instagram. You can send me messages there. You are also welcome to contact me via my website. Um, you can click on the QR code and sh it should bring you somewhere. Or if not, you can just look for me here. Um, but with that, I just want to end off my talk and say thank you very much for being here and for listening in. Um, I'm going to open up this section um, for Caroline to lead, but I'm most happy to take Q&A. And I would love, love, love to hear your voices, see your faces if you are brave enough to come on because I would have loved to do this in person with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, this was just such an inspiring talk and I think such a good example of how career paths are not linear, right? Like yeah. there are these twists and turns that happen in our life and they can take us in wonderful directions. Thank you for watching. My hope is that every message on Kite Dreams will inspire you to dream bravely and live boldly for God. If you've been blessed by these messages, feel free to share them with your friends, subscribe, and I'd love to hear from you. May God grant you the courage and faith to pursue all that He has in store for you. Be blessed.